good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm saying good morning, but I'm afraid my inner clock is saying good night still. <laughs> um, let me see actually if this would work, but yeah. Uh, so uh, my goal is to provide a brief introduction to research data issues. And actually, uh, Nejla already had a great talk, and there will be some overlaps, because there's definitely a common uh, thread in this business. When we say research data, actually, we are really talking about a very inclusive, broad term. Depending on disciplinary practices, data may mean many things. Uh, when, research, uh, when we talk about research methods, there are qualitative methods, quantitative methods, and if you look at the outcomes, uh, we very often think about statistics, but text can be an outcome of research project, specimens, codes, uh, programs, uh, and a broad range of materials. Uh, inquiry, scholarly inquiry often starts with a question or with an issue to explore. And what we consider as scholarly communication circle is a very rich process and it has many outcomes, including formal publications such as monographs and journal articles or conference papers and along the way preprints and postprints. This is a very, pop very, very common, uh, in a way, landscape for us in means of understanding what the outcomes are. But traditionally, we have been focusing on more formal finished products, although I must say last 10, 20 years with repositories, there is also great interest in capturing um, preference too. Uh, actually, I must uh, add that uh, within the social sciences, especially for political scientists and economists, sharing the underlying data has been a very common practice. And what we are seeing, especially during the last five years, is that there's a greater interest in going downstream to the research data collection stage and understanding how data are being gathered and the nature of this data. And there are many reasons uh, for this growing interest, and uh, clearly one of them is um, tax paid, uh, taxer paid funding and accountability, so on and so forth. But what we are really seeing is um, Depending on stakeholders, depending on communities, there are many reasons to promote access to research data. Uh, there is there's a, there's a strong feeling that access to research data would also, in a way, leverage our investment by retooling, by reusing the same research data, research data sets for other purposes. This topic is uh, getting the attention of funders. And in many uh, countries and communities, we are seeing uh, funders to require data management plans. Uh, and in my home institution at Cornell uh, University uh, Library, uh, we recently, well, it's last two, three years, responded to the National Science Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities' interest in uh, asking uh, scientists to start documenting their research process, especially in means of the outcomes of their research process. This is really not a requirement in means of sharing research data, but rather, in a way, um, a methodology to at least track down how these data sets are being created, how they are being stored, and how they will be managed. Uh, and reacting uh, to this request, uh, we did develop a re service point called Research data management service group. And actually, I want to highlight one point here. Uh, Cornell University Library is really only one of the partners in this uh, data management group. Uh, the, the service areas, the policies, procedures really require close collaboration of a range of stakeholders. At Cornell, in our group, we have uh, collaborat our collaborators include Cornell's Information Technology Unit, we have strong involvement from the Office of the Research, Vice Provost's Office, and uh, of course other advanced computing and supercomputing folks. Mm -hmm. And this is just, you know, just to name you a few stakeholders. So library is only a partner. And we offer a range of services um, in, from creating metadata to finding the right, right metadata standard, uh, all the way to understanding, uh, you know, what kind of storage uh, requirements this uh, data set would be requiring. Uh, I, must, I must add that this has been a very uh, fruitful process and we have been learning and we are more and more uncovering what we need to be doing, what we need to be finding, understanding, but it's really just the tip of the iceberg. 
And let me just illustrate to you through, through an example. Actually, before my example, let me provide you some data which would link better. As we were creating this um, research data management service group, we wanted to get a better sense of um, uh, the scientists' practices. And we actually decided to run a pilot survey. It's a pilot survey in the sense that um, we only administered it using um, uh, scientists on scientists who had been involved in NSF projects. So it was really not a comprehensive uh, survey. It included uh, 86 or so uh, scientists. But I just wanted to show you a couple of uh, tables before giving you another example. This illustrates, in a way, what I mean by saying research data means different things. And we were also surprised to see that uh, almost 70% of the scientists surveyed, they uh, said that what they consider their research data is in the, in the text format. And when we looked at the file formats, again, it was surprising because they were very familiar common file formats, such as TXT, document, uh, spreadsheets, and JPEGs. So let me take you to another example now. Um, uh, this is a good uh, uh, way of looking at, again, what uh, Nejla mentioned. We asked them, we said, you know, do you plan to share your research data? Or are you sharing now? And predominantly the answer was maybe, but only small subset of it. And when we asked why they are hesitating to share their research data, most of the reasons uh, described were related to information policy. They were not sure about the security uh, provisions. They were worried about licensing, commercialization, confidentiality, so on and so forth. And actually, another underlying reason, which kind of comes through uh, comments, free text comments, is that many scientists are, in a way, somewhat insecure or not certain whether the data set they have gathered is up to standards and follows their communities, their communities' uh, practices in means of how data are captured, how they are recorded, and the type of metadata surrounding um, this, um, data, the, their data sets. Uh, so let me give you another example before talking a bit about uh, policies, procedures, and infrastructure. Here's uh, Dr. Walcott uh, holding a pigeon. He's one of my favorite scientists. Uh, he's at Cornell, and actually he's a premier uh, neurobiologist. And he has been, last, uh, I would say, 10 years collaborating with several uh, PIs and often funds from the National Science Foundation. And his research area involves loons. And what he does is he tracks these loons, and he looks at their habitats. He looks at their uh, nesting uh, platforms. And he tries to, his main research questions are related to how loons migrate and their nesting and their reproduction uh, patterns. And actually, he has been a, a premier, in a way, scientist in means of his groups because they started these methods of tagging birds, so each bird gets a name, they track the bird, and they try to understand the impact of many factors, including lake and the other uh, environmental factors from you know, pollution to temperature. And uh, as I was preparing for this research, I wanted to kind of see, I, I'm aware of this research project for a long time, but I said, you know, what if I'm a scientist and I want to see what he has produced? So uh, just doing some research, I found out that um, there is a project site called the Loon Project. It's a really nice website because it not only includes some scientific information, but it's really a good example of extending science to public. There is some information very accessible to public. But uh, unfortunately, this site actually resides one of the CoPI's personal website. And then I found uh, hundreds of articles, and all from at different places, some of them closed, some of them open. Here's an example of an article that appeared in the Behavioral Ecology periodical. periodical. And continuing my search, um, I found some data sets put in Cornell's repository. There are hundreds of them. You open them, they're Excel spreadsheets. You look at them, you can't stare at them for a long time. But they are really pretty complex with um, different fields uh, and uh, different values. And luckily, uh, I also ran into a, um, uh, a contextual file, a metadata file. And uh, interestingly, it looks like they got really good advice or they have a very nice, strong community. 
because they did use a metadata standard called ecological metadata language. So there was a file to be able to open and understand how all these data fields are collected, what did they mean, so on and so forth. But unfortunately, it took me probably half an hour to open this file because it was a, it was a proprietary um, extension that I actually ended up really doing some uh, kind of tricking, opening and capturing it as, as a um, PDF file. And uh, let me see if this would work, but also I ran into hundreds of um, sound files, and they are lovely because, as I said, each bird has a name, and that depending on the name, um, uh, this is actual Carol. Yeah. <laughs> so, and of course, uh, continuing my journey, I found video files and so on and so forth. So, the lesson I learned here is as a librarian, it took me more than an hour to pull all these kind of examples together. They were all residing in different places. Some of them were together, but even if they were together, you really had to be really kind of intuitive to understand how they link to each other. And, um, you know, I find it very useful to have this sort of hands-on uh, exercises because it kind of tells you how challenging this whole field of linking information is. And in a way, uh, for many of us, this is the vision, to be able to bring together from upstream research stage all the way to many outcomes of scholarly communication process in a kind of in a cohesive, holistic picture so that uh, we could leverage not only this, uh, not only the resources put in this um, network of research, but also to be able to advance science. Well, such a vision actually requires um, an environment where we factor in uh, several issues. And uh, just uh, for today, I am going to present to you four quadrants, four policy and process areas. And I put usability at the center because I'm really seeing it as a central issue that overlaps with the um, other sectors. Let's start with the technical one. And I think technical one is somewhat familiar to many of us. So it's basically being able to build systems that, that would enable storage and manipulation of these files and their uh, safekeeping through archiving. But of course, it's not as simple. We want this environment to be interoperable. We want metadata standards that would really facilitate the discovery, validation, and access and repurposing. We could have fantastic technical infrastructure, but unless we pay attention to sociocultural issues, uh, many of these fantastic repositories may stay vacant. So therefore, uh, one of the key issues for us is to work closely with the, with the scientists, to uh, listen to them and to better understand what their concerns are and what their needs are. And I must uh, note here that I don't think that we want to be discouraged by hearing from them that you know, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to um, share research data. I think what is important is to understand what would be the enabling or encouraging factors for scientists to start being more open about depositing data. Uh, a critical issue is really respecting their community standards and also understanding that there's a diversity of community standards. And uh, also, again, another issue is uh, uh, you know, understanding and factoring in their access provisions. For some of them, whether it's professional reputation, whether there are concerns about the quality of data, there are many, many reasons. Some of them, they do want embargo periods where for five years or for 10 years, the data would be closed. But uh, again, coming from the US, from some of the federal agencies, uh, they are trying to accommodate these mandates through requiring research data plan and depositing, in a way, requirements, but also allowing some embargo, embargo periods so that this would not be an impediment uh, for, for the scientists. And of course, incentives and rewards. And I, I think that's a very complex issue that will be uh, evolving and we will be seeing uh, new methods here. 
Uh, the other quadrant uh, I want to briefly introduce is the information policies. Uh, you know, clearly, uh, just like any other information field, research data has uh, a range of implications from information policy perspective. And uh, European Union, I'm really curious to hear about uh, the copyright issues, but in the U.S., actually, uh, research data are not covered under copyright. So that also makes uh, uh, some of the scientists very nervous. Although you could use, uh, you know, different uh, agreements and, uh, uh, you know, different, uh, you, could, you could put in place different procedures to be able to protect your data. Uh, but uh, still, it's, it's kind of a blurry line, the copyright over um, research data sets. And I, I put retention and deaccession as a metadata field here. Because I have noticed that at least at Cornell at this point, we are just accepting anything they give to us, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, libraries and archives, uh, they always function with collection development policies. And there are policies in means of uh, understanding the quality of information, but also weeding information. So that's really one of the information policy issues that we may need to look into. How do we decide how long to retain and when to uh, the access and the process. I actually suggest that we look at these uh, research data repositories or services we are developing as a business. I see it as a business because uh, if you look at the service framework, we do need uh, resources, whether they are human resources, equipment, or skill sets. Uh, we do need administrative models with management, governance models to put in place a structure uh, for making decisions, implementing decisions, accessing decisions. And another critical issue is stakeholders. Uh, you know, librarians and archivists, uh, curators, scientists, publishers and societies, governmental agencies, so on and so forth. We are all approaching it from different perspectives with different needs. And it's really critical for uh, stakeholders to be identified and to be understood if we do want this system to work for us. And of course, communication and marketing, as I said, if when we look at it, especially as a business to run. I put usability at the center of my chart because um, research data really is a bit different than some of the formats that we are familiar with, such as um, you know, monographs, periodicals, or images. So imagine running into a PDF file or a JPEG file. You open it, you look at it. Of course, there's some contextual metadata that will help you to understand that data. But still, I think we have the kind of intuitive, uh, you know, background or experience to be able to interpret. Whereas with research data, I showed you a couple of examples. You know, we heard uh, Carol singing for 30 seconds, or, you know, we looked at a data set. For that data to be understood, especially contextualized, it means of when they were gathered, how they were gathered, what these data points mean, you do need really an information framework around these data sets, including uh, information about how research was conducted, uh, how long, uh, you know, it, where and how long it was implemented, uh, readme files to explain the data set, so on and so forth. So I, so I just want to kind of caution us that with research data, we may need to pay attention a bit more to the usability issues. Uh, and just to name a few other usability issues, uh, again, depending on uh, the community standards, ease of uh, deposit will be really a very, very important factor. Unfortunately, we often will be facing this ease of um, deposit versus completeness of deposit challenge. Uh, I'm the program director for archive at Cornell, and one of the huge challenges we have is we have a rather simple metadata set for depositing articles to archive.org, and we know that it's not sufficient. But whenever we experiment with adding anything new, we are seeing you know, a bit kind of frustration or discomfort coming from scientists. So it's just hitting the right point, getting the insufficient data, but also not discouraging them from depositing. Again, I mentioned that research data will be a bit different from usability perspective from some of the uh, formats that we are comfortable with. One of them is uh, to be able to not only understand but interpret and repurpose data. Often, uh, you will need tools, whether it's spreadsheets, statistical analysis applications, 
or visual applications. Um, it doesn't mean that as libraries and research institutions, we should get into supporting research data. However, we should at least be aware of service providers to be able to connect those scientists who are retrieving data from our uh, data um, repositories with services so that they could analyze this data, they could mine it, they could integrate it, they could visualize it. That's really the full circle. And I have other things which are very common. Obviously, we do want them to be persistently located so that there's an ident identifier that would work tomorrow and 10 years from now. And that um, citation standards so that there's a common and uh, trustworthy way of referring to these data sets. So again, uh, being able to tr track them back. Uh, and then my last bullet, metrics to track and communicate impact is a very, very tricky one. Because I'm seeing that in bibliometrics community, uh, it's a bit divisive that especially those who are in the business of information management, those who are funding research, and the scientists, they have very different takes on uh, metrics. Uh, some go very quantitative, you know, 20 articles produced, and some scientists get a bit annoyed with that because you could have one article that has incredible impact and power versus 20 articles that you are just producing for tenure track for qualification purposes. So I try to um, just present uh, some of the issues that we will need to address in means of policies and procedures. And uh, actually, I want to conclude reminding us that uh, scholarly communication is a socio-technical system. It's, it's very complex. And it has evolved through over, a, over several centuries. And as we are really trying to introduce new patterns, new expectations, we really need to understand the dependency among these variables. And I just was able to present today some of the top ones and understand that there's a system, that if you want this system to work, we will need to uh, attend to different quadrants so that we will be able to advance science. Thank you.